Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, in this uh, hall uh, conference about political philosophy today. I'm very glad uh, to be uh, uh, here opening this conference. Uh, it's a good timing for such a conference. Um, Sheila Ben Habib, Professor Sheila Ben Habib is with us. She will be introduced by uh, our colleague Monique Zeta. So I would just like to say that we uh, uh, all have to welcome you here and thank you very much for uh, coming and sharing with us your uh, ideas. I'm going to open up with uh, Derrida, your beloved Derrida. Uh, as he argues in his book, Without Believing, the university, he says, is an ultimate place of critical resistance and more than critical uh, to all the powers of dogmatic and unjust appropriations. The construction, he says, and I'm citing him, an unconditional right to ask critical questions not only about the history of the concept of man, but about the history even of the notion of critique, about the form and the authority of the question about the interrogative form of thought, end of citation. This is radical and does, does not provide us with answers as to the direction and end result or purpose of critique. This is one of the critiques uh, pointed at uh, Derrida. As Wendy Brown argues, resistance goes nowhere in particular, has no inherent attachments, and he has no particular vision. In response, Theoretically, of course, Foucault argues too much <coughs> is expected from philosophy. Especially if it is supposed to specify some universal direction a priori. We expect too much from philosophy, he says, and this expectation from philosophy is very dangerous. And therefore we have to pose questions as to our expectations from philosophy. What do we expect? What do we uh, uh, want it to uh, provide? And uh, uh, I think this conference comes to answer uh, this question. Criticism is good when it is modest and comes to minimize domination. It is ethical only when it criticizes, criticizes without either commit to a specific alternative on the one hand or leads to nihilism on the other. And thereby I'll be warning us from expecting too much from philosophy to the point that we want philosophy to a priori tell us what exactly should happen as a result of the critique. On the other hand, I'll be warning, and I'm warning, of uh, the mode of nothing is important uh, or anything goes, which I'll refer to later on in my, in my uh, uh, response to Sheila's uh, talk. As uh, Deleuze, if Deleuze says, um, we have expectations from, uh, from uh, philosophy, but critique doesn't have to be uh, either reactive or negative only. Critique can be constructive. It doesn't have to direct uh, uh, one way or a clear way as to where things should happen, but it, it could be constructive in the sense uh, that it can provide some ideas as to uh, what is the ethical, if the ethical is actually uh, an expectation of political life. I follow David Hoy in reading Derrida as saying that critique is about calling for the openness to other possibilities that can be gained through an openness to self-criticism. Which means critique has to entail self-criticism in order to be genuine and open and constructive critique. And I hope this day will be, uh, uh, will follow this notion of critique, looking at critique in order to start at least building something that could be followed without falling into tra the traps of the a priori. Thank you very much, very much for being here and I uh, uh, hope that you will stay with us all day. It's going to be uh, an intensive day, uh, interesting day. We have very interesting guests and different topics. Uh, two students of ours will be, and, and I'm very enthusiastic about that, two students of ours will be presenting for the first time in such a conference, so please stay with us to hear them. Uh, and now I pass, uh, oh, before that, I would like to thank a few people, almost I forgot. Uh, 
this this conference is being uh, 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 is being uh, organized by the Public Sphere Journal. As you say, the Public Sphere Journal is the journal of political science in Hebrew at the uh, political science department. And uh, uh, one thing that I would like to start with is that the establisher, the idea of behind uh, uh, the journal came up from uh, at least two colleagues. I don't know who started it before the other. One is uh, Ayal Hovens, who was the chair of the department at that time. And one is not with us here. He is uh, an sabbatical uh, Yoav Pele. Uh, I would like to thank them for the idea, and I hope that uh, you know the the, uh, the journal will continue uh, nourishing and flourishing in the department. Michael Kochin and myself are the uh, how do you call them uh, the, uh, editors, uh, chief editors of the journal. Although it is it is a journal of students, the main work is done by students, and I would like to thank the following people who really uh, contribute very much of their time in order to review and send for review and do all the, uh, the real work behind the, the journal. Avshalom Schwartz is with us. He is the uh, secretary of the editorial board. Rasik Brazilai is the editor of the uh, book uh, review uh, section. Uh, she's also with us. I saw her somewhere. Oh, she's there. Okay, hi. Uh, uh, Adi Gredi Ashkenazi is with us here. She was also before that the secretary of the editorial board. Noah Gani, who is who wants very much to go to Yale, so uh, she will be applying. She will be applying for a PhD at Yale. So uh, this is just you know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, advertisement is is also uh, something part of our life. So. Moshe Dror is not here, I didn't see him. Zohar Avitan, Yaakov Davidovich, uh, I didn't see him either. Omer Soldo, uh, I didn't see him. Maul Boadana, Hadas Lutlinciano, Franz Hood. I really thank uh, to all of them, uh, deep thanks. And uh, now it's the time to pass uh, the microphone to our colleague, Ronit Pele. Thank you very much for the willingness to share this uh, uh, session. So please. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, as is Amal said, we're deeply honored and privileged to have with us today Professor Sheila Bakubid, who is presenting the keynote uh, address. The lecture will be followed by two responders, Professor Amal Jamal and Professor Annabel Herzog. And afterwards, we will open the panel for discussion. Professor Shila bin Habib is the Eger Mayor, Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University, and was the Director of its Program in Ethics, Politi Politics and Economics from 2002 to 2008. Professor Ben Habib is the recipient of the Ernest Bloch Prize uh, for 2009 and for the Leopold Lucas Prize from the University of Tübingen for 2012. She was the president of the Eastern Division of the American Philosophical Association in 2006 and 7, and has been the member of the American Academy of Arts and Science uh, since 1995. She is the author of numerous books and articles. Among the most recent of publication of her publications are the Reluctant Modernism of Hannah Arendt, 1996. To, uh, the Claims of Culture, Equality, and Diversity in Global Area, 2002. The Rights of Others, Alliance, Citizens and Residents, 2004. Uh, another, Cosmopolitanism, Hospitality, Sovereignty, and Democratic Iterations, 2006. And Dignity in Adversity, Human Rights in Troubled Times, 2011. She has most recently edited together with Judith Resnick, Migrations and Mobilities, Gender and Borders, and Citizenship 2009, and also Politics in Dark Times, Encounters with Anna Arendt 2010. Annabel Herzog, I have several papers. Annabel Herzog is a professor, is a member of uh, a Division of uh, Government and Political Theory in the School of Political Science at the University of Haifa. Her research interests include ethics and politics, philosophy and literature, contemporary Jewish philosophy, and the work of Hannah Arendt, Emmanuel Levinas, Abdel Camus, Walter Benjamin, and Jacques Derrida. Professor Amal Jamal 
is the head of the International Graduate Program in Political Science and Political Communication at Tel Aviv University. He's also the head of Executive Graduate Program in Political Communication and the Walter Lieber Institute for Jewish Arab Coexistence at, the University, at Tel Aviv University. He has been the chair of the Political Science Department at Tel Aviv University in the years 2006 to, uh, until 2009, and is currently co-editor-in-chief of the department's journal, The Public Sphere. He is the general director of Ilam Arab Center for Media, Freedom, Development and Research. His research fields include political theory and communication, nationalism, democracy, civil society and social movements, uh, indigenous uh, minority politics and citizenship studies. He has published extensively on these topics in professional international journals. Among his recently published books are the Nakba in Israel's National Memory, in 2015, uh, Arab Minority Nationalism in Israel, The Politics of Indigenity uh, in 2011, and The Palestinian National Movement Politics of Contention, 1967 to 19, uh, 2005, at uh, 2005. So, after all these interesting details, please, Sheila. Well, thank you very much, Todaraba. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, to be back at the University of Tel Aviv. Some years ago, I was teaching with my colleague Leora Bilski from the Faculty of Law at the Tzvi Meitar Center. And my lecture today is called "Clashing Paradigms: Hannah Arendt and Judith Klar on Law and Politics." This is the first time that I'm presenting this paper. So you are my first audience. It is part of a forthcoming uh, book that I call Migration, Statelessness, and Exile, uh, Jewish Political uh, Themes. It uh, deals with uh, uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, Judith Klar, Walter Benjamin, uh, Albert Hirschman, Isaiah Berlin. For me, this is more an exploratory paper because as um, some of you know I work more in the tradition of the critical theory of the Frankfurt School and uh, uh, Habermas and communicative ethics, but in this paper I explore uh, the relationship of, of conceptions of law and politics in uh, the thought of uh, two extremely influential uh, women who at least were aware of each other but never really uh, engaged when they were uh, when they were uh, alive. So I'm going to read parts of this paper and talk through uh, parts of it. But uh, during the bitter controversy concerning Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, which had appeared in 1963, a little-known lecturer in the government department at Harvard University by the name of Judith M. Schwar published Legalism an essay on law, morals, and politics in 1964. Written in the direct and acerbic style that would become her mark, Schlar states, quote, this is then a polemical and opinionated book. It is, however, not meant to be destructive. The object here is to stir up controversy by a clear confrontation of incompatible positions, not just to upset the general academic apple cart, end of quote. Schlar's wish to stir up controversy at the time was not fulfilled. The book was largely ignored by legal theorists as well as political philosophers when it first appeared, but it did signal the emergence of the singular voice of one younger than Jewish-German luminaries like Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss who dominated American academia in political theory at the time. Judith Clark belonged to a generation of European Jewish emigres whose world was shattered, and as she expressed it in one of her most poignant and, to my knowledge, only piece of autobiographical writing, whose childhood had been broken by Hitler. Born to a German speaking family of doctors living in Riga, Latvia, they escaped to Sweden then to Siberia, Japan, and Canada. At McGill, Schlar studied political theory with Frederick Watkins before coming to do her doctoral work with Carl Friedrich 
at Harvard, who had also been Watkins's advisor. What Clark called her bare bones liberalism carried the indelible marks of disbelief in the face of a world gone insane. Yet what is distinctive about her voice as an emigre political theorist and what sets her apart from Leo Strauss and Hannah Arendt, both approximately 20 years her elder, is the lack of pathos with which she registered the destruction of her familial world and the end of her childhood. Although brought up in a German-speaking household, Judith Clark was not a German-Jewish philosopher. Her skeptical and restrained temp temperament put her rather in the company of East European ironists like Franz Kafka, Milan Kundera, or Georgi Konrad. For her, the rise of European fascism and the Holocaust were not to be interpreted as, quote, the end of Western nationality, as Adorno and Horkheimer had argued, or as the end of our tradition of politics, as Hanar and Sorry. Schlar was unsure that there had ever been a single tradition of Western reason or rationality, and she disliked the self-congratulatory emphasis on the West. She wrote, there is no one Western tradition, it is a tradition of traditions. Moreover, political freedom has been the exception, a rarity in Europe's past, remote, and recent. Whereas Leo Strauss and Hannah Arendt remained Grecophiles in some ways, Schwar was a decided modernist, more at home in the skeptical temperament of the French encyclopedist than within the orbit of the German love affair with Hellas. She found Arendt often capricious in her interpretations of political thinkers and traditions and was deeply critical of Arendt's reading of Kant's political theory. In fact, Schlar, as the more junior political theorist that uh, wrote uh, uh, about Arendt um, three or four times in different occasions, but there was never a, a conversation. Though tremendously respectful of Arendt, as the towering figure of her generation, she also charged her with incurable romanticism in her belief that noble and civic republican politics were possible. Now, no other work reveals Schlar's unique temperament and her skeptical approach toward the pieties of liberalism while remaining a liberal as emphatically as the early book on legalism. So what I will do in this lecture now is uh, I will focus in the next part on a close reading of this work called Legalism. Uh, then I will discuss briefly um, Schlar's comments on the Nuremberg Trials. Legalism is a book basically devoted to the problematic of political trials. Then in the concluding sections, I will move towards a comparative discussion of Arendt and Schlar and with a digression on Carl Schmidt on law and politics. But I want to go through a careful reading of Schlar on legalism because as we were beginning to say in the conversation before this lecture, Schlar is now being read and revived as a political theorist, that political realist that is critical of liberalism. She's being juxtaposed to uh, Rawls and Habermas and Dworkin. I think this reading of Schlar does injustice to her own complex relationship uh, to, uh, to liberalism. Whatever Judith Clark is, she was not a political realist. She's a political liberal of a sort that is difficult maybe to grapple with. So with the memory of the Nuremberg trials and the McCarthy hearings in the United States still very much alive, in legalism, Schlar positioned herself against too much self-congratulation on the part of liberal democracies. Drawing a rather sharp line between the ideology of free market capitalism and the political essence of liberalism, she wrote of her contribution, I'm quoting, it is, at its simplest, a defense of social diversity. Inspired by that bare bones liberalism, which, having abandoned the theory of progress and every specific scheme of economics, is committed only to the belief that tolerance is a primary virtue 
and that the diversity of opinions and habits is not only to be endured, but to be cherished and encouraged. The assumption throughout this book, she says, is that social diversity is the prevailing condition of modern nation states and that it ought to be promoted. And of course. But what exactly is legalism? In one of her early definitions, she says, it is the ethical attitude that holds moral conduct to be a matter of rule following and moral relationships to consist of duties and rights determined by rules. Now, this is far puzzling because it seems at first to suggest that Sklar's concern is with moral philosophy rather than with legal theory, because right at the start, legalism is defined as an ethical conduct that considers morality to be a matter of rule following. Uh, I'll be briefly remind you that Schlar, who was to write a book on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit later, at times seems to be echoing Hegel's critique of uh, Kantian, Kantian moral theory. And yet, although she devotes a few pages to a critique of Kantian morality, Schlar in this book is not really concerned with moral theory, but with legalism, so that this early definition is in some ways quite misleading. Legalism is, for her, a way of thinking about the law that tries to insulate the law from morals as well as from politics. So the first part of the book is devoted to a critique of analytical legal positivism, including Hans Kelsen and HLA Hart, as well as natural law. So she keeps seeing an analogy between the positivism of Hart and Kelsen and natural law theories. In my opinion, this does not quite succeed because the trouble with natural law uh, theories is not that they separate morality, legality, and politics, but that they see a continuum between morals and the law and even uh, a certain kind of politics and the law. So I think the real target of Schlar's uh, work in this, uh, in this book is the tradition of legalité, or what Max Seber would call legal rationale Herrschaft. And um, in particular, the way in which then this is taken up by Kelsen and HLA Hart. So I'm not going to say much now about her critique of natural law theories uh, at this uh, point. Now, why would Schlar refer to legalism? legal positivism and its emphasis on formalism as an ideology. She says, law, the bareness of the law, the fact that law is accepted as legitimate and uh, is not at all obvious, and she sees law as part court of a social uh, uh, continuum. Now, this emphasis that law is part of a social continuum and cannot be separated from society and politics as such, have led some to say that Schlar was a postmodernist avant la lettre, or to see her as a kind of precursor of the critical legal studies movement in the, in the United States. But again, neither of these classifications can do justice to her own conflictual account of the relationship between legalism and liberalism. And permit me now to quote, I think, what is the essence of her position, and which is um, a complex position that I don't think she herself can quite justify. OK, this is page 112. Uh, quote, the great paradox revealed here is that legalism as an ideology is too inflexible to recognize the enormous potential of legalism as a creative policy but exhausts itself in intoning traditional pieties and principles incapable of realization. This is, of course, the perennial character of ideologies. It should not, however, in this case, lead one to forget the greatness of legalism as an ethos. To parse this statement, which comes from the opening section of part two of the book, in this case, lead one to forget the greatness of legalism as an ethos. To parse the statement, which comes from the opening section of part two of the book devoted to international law and Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, for Schlar, legalism has three dimensions. 
It is an ideology that interprets what she calls mature legal systems. It is a creative policy, and it is also the ethos of the law. And it is these three dimensions of legalism as ideology, as creative policy, and as ethos of the law that somehow in the book never get reconciled. Now, it's interesting that by ideology, unlike the Marxist tradition, Schlar does not mean false consciousness or distorted consciousness or anything of that kind. For her, ideology, quote, is a series of personal responses to social experiences which come to color, color all our categories of thought. And for Schlar, often, Ideology means thick contextualization, and she refers to what she does uh, often not just as a political theorist, but as an intellectual uh, historian. Now, uh, I think to give you a flavor of her critique of legalism in terms of the self-understanding of legal systems, and then I will come back to these three dimensions of legalism, I want to just mention briefly Schlar's uh, critique or historical contextualization of Kelsen. Uh, Kelsen is present throughout the work and I think is one of the major addressees of the book. She writes about Kelsen uh, as science of law, pure science of law. It's a homeless ghost. In fact, she says, it is clear enough to an historian that is, it is not fortuitous that Kelsen's pure theory had its origins in the Vienna, in which psychoanalysis and logical positivism also had their home. All these concentrated attacks on traditional myths and irrationalities of every sort arose in the midst of a veritable cauldron of religious, social, and ideological conflict. All our negative responses to the fanaticized consciousnesses and the distortions which it, enger, which it engenders. Here, she says, liberalism is bound to identify itself with the ideal of a strong but neutral state that stands above and aloof from the wars of ideology and thus morality. The pure science of law is a vision of the law of just such a state, end of quote. It's quite a remarkable contextualization of Kelsen in 1964, and from the standpoint of maybe more Anglo-Saxon discussions, uh, Schlar uh, contextualizes Kelsen's legal theory in the Vienna of its time before this famous book by Alan Janning and Stephen Tulmin called Wittgenstein's Vienna, which opened up that intellectual uh, dimension almost 15, uh, 15 years um, uh, later. But uh, let, us, uh, ret let us return to the question. If legalism is on the one hand the ideology of a pure system of law that considers itself above politics, and on the other hand legalism is creative policy and ethos, how can she, how can she justify these three dimensions and hold them, hold them uh, together? Now, Schlar is an honest thinker, and she says, with reference to her own thinking, that anyone who asserts that justice is a policy and that the judicial process is not the antithesis of politics, but just one form of political action among others, must expect to meet certain outraged accusations. So what's the answer? The answer, she says, is that there is politics and politics, a very Talmudic answer. There's mm -hmm. politics and politics. As opposed to Victor's justice and sham political trials, she says, there are occasions where political trials may serve liberal ends, where they promote legalistic values in such a way as to contribute to constitutional politics and to a decent legal system. The trial of the major war criminals by the International Military Tri Tribunal at Turem Nuremberg probably had that effect. So although there is no law uh, without politics or outside politics, there can be instances when political trials can promote a creative policy or creative you know, liberalism. 
But can Schwar really put to rest claims of Sieger Justice about the Nuremberg trials, the victory, the triumph of the victors? In fact, her own critique of the defect of the trials goes even beyond the accusation that what was practiced here was a form of the justice of the victor. Even in the non-pejorative sense of ideology, it is hard to defend and legalism as a policy and to recommend it as an ethos once it is demystified by the contextual work of the intellectual historian. The work of contextualization and the work of normative advocacy, such as would be required to recommend a policy or an ethos, are in tension. This means that, to my mind, Clark's principal objective reconciling liberalism and legalism remain elusive and paradoxical. And I'm going to quote here a passage from Samuel Moyne, a legal historian and legal theorist, who is one of the few in the contemporary world who is working on Judas Klar. And Samuel Moyne rightly concludes that legalism not only does work, but must work as a noble lie, Plato's noble lie. Philosophers and perhaps associated guardians know it is false, but allow its many votaries to proceed as if it were true, because only the myth makes their conduct possible." End of quote. That is to say, legalism is the noble lie that politics and the law can be separated, whereas for Schklar, uh, politics is, if you wish, all the way, all the way done. Let me come now to Schklar's discussion of the Nuremberg trials. And I'm going to call the section a case of the anxiety of influence, question mark. The young Judish Klar sat uh, in the Harvard University Widener Library reading the transcript of the Nuremberg trials, just as Hannah Arendt, who had traveled to Jerusalem to attend the opening sections of the Eichmann trial, would pour over the thousands of pages she had brought with her in New York. Schlar is one of the first to address the philosophical puzzles of international criminal law in the post-World War II period. There was and is no system of international law, criminal law, she declaims, just as there are no international community and international political institutions to formulate or regularly enforce criminal laws. I mean, you can see how deep her skepticism here is about international law and institutions, and it's, it's hard to see how she's going to reconcile all this with a, with a, a commitment to uh, liberalism. Yet, despite this militant dismissal of international criminal law, Schlar reaches the surprising conclusion that, quote, what makes the Nuremberg trial so remarkable is that, in the absence of strict legal justification, it was a great legalistic act the most legalistic of all possible policies, and as such, a powerful inspiration to a legalistic ethos." End of quote. While the trial was a political one, in that it aimed to eliminate a political enemy and its ideology, it need not give offense neither to legalistic or liberal values, she concludes. And this is so because the crimes against humanity were the moral center of the case. It is surprising that of the three charges considered in the Nuremberg trials, crimes against the peace or aggressive war, war crimes and crimes against humanity, Schlar should focus insistently on crimes against humanity as the principal creative achievement of the trial. Her reasons were as follows. She thought that the charge against the Nazis of aggressive war was justifiably subject to the argument of two quo que particularly because the Soviets were also part of the Nuremberg, um, uh, uh, the London signatory of the Nuremberg Commission. That is, the leaders of states judging the Nazis, in her opinion, had committed no less criminal acts against the peace than the Nazis did. Regarding the charge that the Nazis had committed war crimes, Schlar's answer is that, of course they had, but they had also engaged in acts that went far beyond the Hague, the Hague Convention of 1907, which the French representative on the tribunal wanted to consider the binding document under which war crimes could be litigated. Uh, Schlar thought that this position was ridiculous. 
So Schlarn, like Hannah Arendt, is convinced that what justifies the charge of crimes against humanity is the novelty of the act that the Nazis had engaged in. To say, she said, that the charges of crime against humanity was unknown is therefore no argument against it. You will recall that in Eichmann in Jerusalem, Arendt had argued that the Jerusalem court had made a mistake in condemning Eichmann first for crimes against the Jewish people in the first instance, and by naming crimes against humanity only as the third and separate charge. And I know that probably many of you are familiar with the spectacular conclusion to Eichmann in Jerusalem, where Arendt herself speaks in the name of the judges of Israel, quite a remarkable dramaturgical moment in the, in the text. But for Arendt, um, genocide, which is the highest of the crimes against humanity, is an attack upon the human status as such, that is, upon human plurality, the condition under which life on earth is given to man, human beings. Plurality is the fact that corresponds to our irreducible sameness as members of the same species, and at the same time expresses our irreducible difference from one another. Plurality is the condition of human action, because we are all the same, that is human in such a way that nobody is ever the same as anyone who has ever lived, lives, or will live. Now, Arendt attempts an ontological analysis of crimes against humanity and genocide via her theory and ontology of the human condition and action. I'm not going to go into whether or not Arendt's ontology is successful. This is not the point. But the point here is that Schlar says nothing about the justification of crimes against humanity, which was a novel uh, category in uh, legal thought at the time and which many legal thinkers were extremely skeptical about, including many who were members of the commission. Uh, the British representative thought that this was utterly, totally rid ridiculous. And undoubtedly, Schlar would not accept Arendt's ontological anchoring of the concept of genocide in plurality, and she would consider this, maybe Schlar would, a variant of natural law, uh, natural law thinking. But can we rest satisfied with the simple positing of a new criminal statute to deal with new and unprecedented acts? As is well known, the German defense lawyers, both in Nuremberg and during the Eichmann trial, kept raising the objection of, in Latin, you know, nulla crimen, nulla buena sine lege, no crime, no punishment without the law, right? Although none went so far as to claim that the mass slaughter of innocent civilians, women and children, was a justifiable act of war, rather they maintained, if you remember uh, famous uh, um, defense attorney, Severius Eichmann's defense attorney, they maintained that the overall criminality of the regime left no choice but to consider the will of the pure as the law of the land. In that sense, legality in the Third Reich meant criminality. Yeah. This form of perverted consciousness exercised by the likes of Eichmann clearly was what Schlar herself had in mind partially by the term legalism, that is blind obedience to orders and the law of the land, no matter how morally perverse and criminal. Yet by leading the concept of crimes against humanity so unelaborated and philosophically justified, Schlar left her own argument open to the charge of Sieger Justice, the triumph of the victors. As for the Eichmann case, she writes, it does not really create new problems for legal theory. Eichmann, she continues, alas, was always a Jewish problem. According to her, from the non-legal point of view, the trial had to be ju judged in terms of its political value for the various Jewish communities but from a theoretical problem, from a theoretical point of view, the problems were the same in Nuremberg and in the Eichmann trial. There was no need to consider them separately. But is this really so? Without the evidence concerning the Nazi genocide of the Jews, which was not at all central to the Nuremberg trials, if you will remember, 
the category of crimes against humanity hangs in mid-air, and this was the central problem in the Eichmann trial. In this sense, I think the Eichmann trial contributed much more to the project of international criminal law theoretically than Sklar may have been willing to admit. And here I want to ask, was this a case of the possible anxiety of influence on her part vis-a-vis -vis Hannah Arendt's towering contribution or was it indicative of deeper differences among the two thinkers, or possibly of both? So let me now move towards a more comparative analysis, because uh, my job, I know that maybe many of my criticisms of Schlar are coming across as being very uh, dismissive for the sake of time. I'm just picking up you know, the crucial points, but I'm engaged in an internal reading. I'm, I'm doing a pilpul on the text because I think she's an important, uh, important uh, thinker. And so uh, let me now uh, think about law and politics for her and for her and for Arendt. Whereas for Schklar, the law, the law was irretrievably and thoroughly political, Arendt in the human condition likened the law to the fences and the walls drawn around the city that first made the law possible. The purpose of law was to unite as well as to separate the members, and of course for Arendt, it's always the demos, by defining the boundaries that demarcated the public from the private, the oikos, the household from the polis. Arendt's strict separation between the private sphere of the household and the public sphere of the polis is beset with tremendous conceptual difficulties, not the least of which is the consequences it has for the status of women, and many of us have engaged in feminist critiques of Arendt justifiably on this issue. But granted this, it would be a mistake to think that Arendt ontologized and naturalized simply the law's relation to politics, where Schlar thought that law was political all the way down. Rather, for Arendt, more so than for Schlar, the law both framed the political and thus had to stand in some sense outside it. And on the other hand, the law was only made possible by the political act of humans joining together in contract, association, and promise. The relationship between law and politics, I'm going to say, introducing a term I have used in my other work, in other cosmopolitanism and so on, is recursive. Neither precedes the other, they enable each other, they need to be presupposed, but they eat each act on the other. Now, to understand the distinctiveness of Arendt's position, I'm going to take here a brief detour and consider her critique of uh, Carl Schmidt, who is the hidden interlocutor of the opening pages of The Human Condition. Now, in the longer version of this chapter, I'm also going to discuss Schlar's comments on Schmidt. And let me say something here that gets very complicated. Karl Friedrich, um, Schlar's teacher, clearly was very familiar with Karl Schmidt. And terms like legalismus, and then Schlar writes an essay called Decisionismus, which is very, you know, Schmidt is mentioned and dismissed. But I think there is more to the story than that. That the, the interesting thing about Schlar is that she's using the terms of Weimar political theory, but translating them into an Anglo-American medium. Decisionism was not an issue in the 1960s, late 1960s in the United States. It comes from Weimar, decisionismus, existentialism. So, but what I'm going to talk about here is uh, uh, Arendt and Schmidt, and bear with me for a second, because I think this is going to clarify this question about the ontology of law. What is the really, what, where is, if law needs a ground, if it needs a ground, how can we understand it? In a brilliant and original essay, Anna Zurkevich, one of my doctoral students in the Yale Political Science Department, has unearthed Hannah Arendt's critique of Carl Schmitt in the opening pages of The Human Condition. And the opening pages of The Human Condition engages with a work of Schmitt called The Nomos of the Earth. And The Nomos of the Earth is a late work of Carl Schmitt which discusses international law. It's a work of the 1950s. I think personally it's one of his best works that shows him 
as the legal theorist that he is, and not just as a Nazi theorist that he also, also is. Now, what um, Zhukevich has uh, uncovered is in the Hannah Arendt Library at Bard College, Arendt reads the Nomos of the Earth and writes in the margins continuously. What is at stake here? What is at stake here is the meaning of nomos. And in the opening pages of the human condition, the, the discussion nomos means law in Greek. So the whole question is, how does the political emerge? How does the polis emerge? What is the foundation of the nomos? Now, for Schmidt, nomos emerges out of the earth. He says, in terms that remind one of Heidegger, the elementaren ordnung ihres terrestrischen Daseins, the elementary order of the terrestrial being. And he adds, we seek to understand the normative order of the earth. The normative order of the earth, Sinnreich der Erde, what could be the normative order of the earth? Does the earth have a normative order? Um, now, these ontological theses about law as nomos, the earth and its meaning, have their sources in an old and ongoing debate that Schmidt was involved in with neo-Kantians such as Hans Kelsen. And as Raphael Gross explains in an illuminating article, Schmidt adopted the concept of nomos inherited from the political theology of German Protestantism and advocated by Wilhelm Stapel in order to develop a confrontation with Judaism. What is the source of the authority of law, human will, or reason, or some more fundamental order that precedes human acts of law giving? Does the law express principles of human justice, or is the law grounded in some order but that precedes but nevertheless constrains justice. Schmidt is not a natural law theorist, and he cannot respond to Kelsen by invoking natural law. Rather, he appeals to an order of the earth, Zinsreich der Erde. By contrast, the positivist understanding of law sees law as covering both earth and sea, and as emerging to speak with Kant whenever the will of one must be brought under the law of freedom to coexist with the will of the other. For uh, Schmidt, the German concept of law, Gesetz, is deeply implicated in the theological opposition between Jewish law and Christian, and Christian uh, grace. Arendt, by contrast, denies this naturalistic origin of law, which permits Schmidt to establish the via etymological shorthands of naming to take to possess and nomos. So here is Schmidt playing with the meanings of nomos and naming. Forgive me if, if you know this, this section is a little difficult, but bear with me. Now, Arendt is quite clear that Schmidt engages in a pseudo and ontological derivation of law from terrestri terrestriality, and that this serves as a justification of the domination of the earth. That is to say, the appropriation of the earth, besitzname, gives rise, seems to give rise to the law. This is the, this is the crucial point. The act of taking possession seems itself to give rise to the law rather than the law justifying or legitimizing taking possession. And of course, in Schmidt's hands, this particular understanding of law and the relationship between law and terrestriality is part of the justification of his Grossraum theory of Nazi expansion. Yeah? That's what's going on. And it's interesting that Arendt is picking up on this in this, in this uh, uh, work. So as Jurkevich explains, Arendt accuses Schmidt in his answer to the question, what is the source of law? of not understanding the relationship between law and politics because he does not understand the nature of the political. It isn't just friend or foe. Plurality, the primary condition of politics for Arendt, is absent from Schmidt's nomos. 
Etymologically, Arendt agrees with Schmidt that nomos comes from the word nemein in Greek, which means both acquisition, nemein, and division, dividing. There is, of course, a circularity here. We have to admit it. There can be no polis without nomos. There can be no city without the law. And there can be no law without the city. So the origins of law still remain mysterious. Does it originate in custom, a divine lawgiver who gives law to the community? Or does the law simply originate via a spontaneous act of self-constitution through which the polis becomes a unity? Note here that as opposed to Jewish and Islamic concepts of law, according to which, I hope I'm right here, the foundations of law go back to an act of divine command through which the community of believers binds itself to the Lord, the God, that, that's the, 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 the law is ultimately grounded in the voice of God, Arendt's conception as well as Schmidt's are thoroughly secular. And precisely on, account, on this account of secularity, she cannot deny the paradoxes that uh, affect every act of self-constitution. As opposed to Schmidt, who mystifies the politics of law by establishing an ontological connection between law and territory, and as opposed to Schklar, for whom the law is thoroughly political and emerges out of a social continuum and historical milieu, Arendt is aware of the conundrum in justifying law's foundational authority with respect to uh, the uh, political. Um, Arendt and Schklar, then, do not disagree about the political character of law. But whereas Schklar is convinced that legalism and liberalism cannot be reconnected even in a disenchanted universe that has demystified the sources of law, Arendt still searches for some element in the Western tradition, for some aspect of political experience to give law solidity without ontologizing it. She finds this in the Roman concept of lex, in contrast to nomos, originating with the word ligare, meaning an intimate connection or relationship. Ligare, lex, later comes to mean contract. Roman lex makes intersubjective relationship among citizens and peoples the basis of law through lex, political relationships are extended. But lex is boundless. It does not contain its own limits. If the concept of nomos is caught in the pseudo-concreteness of suggesting that law emerges from territoriality, lex suggests a dizzying possibility of alliances, misalliances, promise-keeping and breaking harmony and strife, or the contentiousness of the political. For Arendt, what stabilizes the boundlessness of action is the creation of institutions. The binding of the will toward the future, that is, the project of Constitutio Libertatis, uh, the constitution that binds liberty. Successful revolutions initiate a new order. They make possible a new world of human affairs within which human action can now unfold. For her, as for Schklar, neither nature nor historical development can guarantee such success. The stability of good institutions remains fragile. Political philosophy, either as the retrieval of past treasures, which Arendt considered herself to be engaged in, or as the practice of the historian of ideas, bent on demystification, as Clark thought herself to be doing, can offer no future guarantees. I move then to a conclusion. Both Arendt and Schklar distance themselves from the natural law tradition as well as from legal positivism. Whereas Arendt attempts to place the law in the context of her theory of human condition, Schklar does not entrench the law in any broader understanding of human capabilities. For both, Good law and sound legal institutions are the preconditions of decent politics. Although she leaves the relationship of liberalism to legalism somewhat tenuous, and remarks that legalism has been used by authoritarian systems as well, Schklar insists that justice and equality go hand in hand, though not always without conflict. Arendt's concern is with containing, containing or binding the originary violence may be inherent in, at the founding moment of polities, such as that the demos 
as a new polis can sublimate its violence through a promise to bind its will to the future. This fear is at the source of her much disputed contrast between the American and French revolutionaries. The French revolutionaries, she thought, they, who thought they were establishing a new Rome, were caught perpetually in the destructive dynamic of the Assemblée Constituante, constituting the Assembly, and the Assemblée Constituante. But when the will of the nation was seen as the source of all power and of the legitimacy of law, there were no ropes to bind Ulysses to the mast and to re resist the call of the sirens. To recall here Jon Elster's famous argument about constitutionalism and politics in his famous book, Ulysses and the Sirens. Who binds Ulysses to the mast? It was a matter of historical contingency and the good luck of the American revolutionaries that they were not in the first place representatives of the nation, la, la nation as such, but were representatives of 13 colonies in whose name they signed the Declaration of Independence. As Jacques Derrida has observed, the moment of signing is when the American people in whose name the Declaration uh, speaks originated. It was born through a performative moment when the signatories brought into existence something new in the name of the old. Both Arendt and Schlar are interested in such moments of founding of republics and in exploring what lets the performative do its work since the performative never creates the conditions of its own validity, my eternal disagreement with Judith Butler. The performative does its work because of some other preconditions that remain to be analyzed. The legitimacy of the law is indeed dependent upon a social continue. And these presuppositions of law, which may remain hidden from the standpoint of the participants, are iterated, reiterated recursively in the moment of founding. Iteration, I will conclude briefly, this is a concept I've used in my other work, is a process through which what is putatively considered an original is repeated or iterated and transformed in the process to speak with Hegel in repositing what is posited as a presupposition, we transform it, we sublate it. In the process of repeating a term or a concept, we never simply produce a replica quote of a first intended usage or meaning. Every repetition is a form of variation. I might add that this is the fundamental mistake of all originalism, where, whether in law, politics, hermeneutic or biblical interpretation, there is no first. The first is always constituted. It's interpretation all the way down. Meaning in these processes of repetition by attempt transformation, even if the repetition takes itself to be repeating what it considers the original, in these processes, meaning is enhanced and transformed. And when the creative appropriation of what is considered authoritative ceases or stops making sense, then, quote unquote, the original loses its authority, or we might say, tradition enters into crisis. Through such processes, we realize that there actually is no original, and that every original is the consequence of a prior interpretation or iteration that has been accorded a status. This is not the place to expand philosophically on these views further, except to say that a non-foundationalist understanding of politics and law would accept the interpretive unfolding of iterative processes as the medium through which the universal and the concrete are mediated and law and politics are brought into interaction with one another. I want to conclude here with a passage from my colleague Robert Post, Dean of the Yale Law School, which seems to me to capture in very clear terms this iterative or recursive understanding of law and politics that I'm just gesturing at uh, uh, here. He writes, quote, politics and law are thus two distinct ways of managing the inevitable social facts of agreement and disagreement. As social practices, politics and law are both independent and interdependent. They are independent in the sense that they are incompatible. To submit a political controversy to legal resolution is to remove it from the political domain. 
To submit a legal controversy to political resolution is to undermine the law. Yet, law and politics are interdependent in the sense that law requires politics to produce the shared norms that law enforces, whereas politics requires law to stabilize and entrench the shared values that politics strives to achieve." End of quote. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.